Welcome to Humanities 102, Discussion on Modernism, which we can see as cultural transformation. This is primarily a phenomena in Western countries during the era we are studying. So what are the characteristics of modernism? We have rejection of existing culture, a rebellious nature. We have people uprooted from ancestral territory, from the place of origin or where maybe they've lived for 25 generations. We have an outpouring of positive and negative perceptions on the human condition. A lot of what's going on is in response to the industrialized world, and it's focused more on city life than uh, the rural farm country that we saw in the Romantic period, especially in the paintings of the United States. We have this idea of the oppositional culture versus the respectable culture. So young people revolting against the traditions of their parents. And a very important idea here is this one of progress, that the human condition in the past was not as ideal as we would have liked it, but with progress, new technology, we can change that and create a, a better world to live in now. And then there's this idea of what is the modernist area. So it's 1892 whenever. The peak years in Western countries are from 1890 to about 1930, but we still see a lot of modernist work in the 40s and 50s. Modernism ends in either the 1950s and 60s, or it's still continuing today, depending on your perspective. Remember, we have a lot of different scholars working in the field, and some people feel that we're still in a modernist era, and some people feel that postmodernism supplemented or basically ended the modern era. Uh, There were a lot of changes that happened with modern arts. And by modern arts, I don't just mean the visual arts like painting, but also including literature, dance, music, architecture, etc. One of the, the big changes is this rise of photography. And then later on in this era, we will see the rise of cinema. And these technologies can capture the real. What we perceive as the real when we look around our daily life. Therefore, that frees up art to focus on our imagination rather than our literal experience. And that helps us move into a symbolic world where things are not literal, they're symbolic, the meanings are not explicit, And due to the changes in technology where we have ease of moving about the planet, we starting in the West starts incorporating ideas from non-Western cultures. And we see that we'll see that a little bit with Gauguin going to Tahiti and Picasso with a kind of African mask style painting. But this love affair with Western cultures towards non-Western cultures and somehow this idea that because they have not, the non-Western cultures have not civilized as much, that they have some essential truth or value that we've lost in our culture. And then you have this idea of perversity. And per by perversity, I mean anything that is outside what common social standards indicate as appropriate. For example, in some cultures in the early 
1900s and late 1800s, women were not allowed to show their legs. This was known as the Victorian era, and it was thought that legs would lead to a decline in morality to the point that even tables had full tablecloths on them to hide the legs because apparently men would become sexually aroused by looking at the legs of tables. Yes, you can laugh, but that was how people thought. So in the modern era, there's an embrace of these types of perversities of showing the legs of tables, showing the legs of women, um, doing things that were not considered acceptable in early, earlier areas. And then we start to see what I think we currently have a great emphasis on, which is this idea of technology as a religious tradition or our emphasis on pro progress. Nowadays, everybody has their phone. People can't live without their phone. We have computers, we have nonstop media. A lot of people have a thousand zillion channels on their television. We can watch anything and we love that and we worship that. And then finally, during the modern era, we're moving into the age of the machine. Another big change that happens in this area is how we view knowledge and how knowledge works. This is called the study of epistemology. It comes from the Greek word epistem, which is, means knowledge and understanding, and logia, which is science and study. There's three main questions that arise. What is knowledge? How is knowledge acquired? And what do people know? And these basic ideas drive a lot of the work in the humanities, the social sciences, the hard sciences as we go forward through the 1900s and obviously into our current era. And this idea of what is knowledge, so for example, the knowledge that it takes to be successful here in San Diego consists of a college education, a marketable skill, a family, friends, a world in which creates meaning for you, whether it's through culture, arts, religion, any sort of symbolic functioning. But if, for example, you were born in the Amazon rainforest, having a college education probably wouldn't do anything for you because people don't have jobs. They live off the land. And in that culture, different types of knowledge are more important. And up until the modernist area, we assumed that theoretical knowledge, like being a great mathematician, had more value than being able to fish in the Amazon River. And now, as we work through the 1900s and into this era, we start realizing that there's so many different kinds of knowledge and people acquire knowledge differently. For example, we're in an online class. That's one method of acquiring knowledge. Other people may go to the library and read books for days on end, and that's another method of acquiring knowledge. Some people acquire knowledge through experience. Some people acquire knowledge through mistakes. So. This is a huge topic. It's not one we're really going to focus on in this class, but I want you to understand how in the modernist era, when we start questioning things like what is knowledge and how do we acquire knowledge and who knows what and what does that mean, it changes our cultural artifacts significantly. And then finally, where does modernism go? Well, that also is a big subject and we could spend an entire year studying that. But for the purposes of this course, modules 11, 12, and 13 will all cover the modernist era in Western cultures. And then 
In modules 14 and 15, we'll focus on the postmodern era. And I've put together this little table that will show you some of the differences between modernism and postmodernism. It's not, there's not a definite line where modernism ends and postmodernism starts. But these are some very simplified categories of what constitutes a modernist musical piece, art piece, building, the lit work of literature via a postmodernist. So both modernism and postmodernism are responding to the industrialized world and this dehumanized quality that many people perceive in industrial capitalist countries. And it pre presents a fragmented view of human subjectivity. We'll get into that idea of human subjectivity when we get to postmodernism. But I wanted to point out a few differences. So in the modernist world, they're attempting to create, create some kind of order out of this perception of chaos. So for example, Einstein trying to come up with the relativity theory and a unifying theory that would prove everything. Whereas in the postmodern era, we acknowledge disorder and often these ideas of one truth that's applicable to everything are not only left behind, but actively worked against. Then in the modernist era, we have bigger themes, meta narratives. A meta narrative might be something like the Horatio Alger myth here in the United States that everybody has the opportunity to pull themselves up by their bootstraps and become a successful business person if that's what they choose to do. Whereas in the postmodern era, we focus more on the micro narrative and the specificity of situations. And we realize that not everybody has the same opportunity in this country due to uh, family issues, educational opportunities, geographical locations, uh, abilities, disabilities, and on and on. And then in modernism, there was a little more focus on dualism or a binary, something is true or it's not true. Uh, things are black and white, whereas as we get into the postmodern era, we're focusing on pluralism. There is no true, not true. There is just varying shades of true. And then as Frederick Jameson points out, these artistic trends go along with some trends in capitalism. And his theory is that the production of objects, the manufacturing of physical things like shovels and cars and wagons, that's when that is happening, when that is the primary means of generating wealth, we're in a modernist era. And then when we go into postmodernism, it's all about multinational corporations, consumer marketing, and the emphasis here is on the marketing, not the making. In other words, the people who sell and market make the money, not the people who make the shovel. And that is our brief lecture on modernism. I hope you enjoyed it. Have a great day.